Holy Father, we have come again that you will feed us with manna of heaven. Spirit of a living God, feed our spirit man with a heavenly manna. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise God. Uh, this is the fourth in the series on grace. And today we are going to be looking at grace before the foundation of the world. Our focus is on grace before the foundation of the world. You would recall that in series one, we heard about five definitions of grace. I will just give a few of them. One, we said that grace is the undeserved, unearned, and unmerited favor of God bestowed upon sinful men. Secondly, we said that grace is the operational or divine ability of God in a man to accomplish a specific God-given assignment. Thirdly, we said that grace means beauty or attractiveness. It's, it's like a magnet, a pulling force that attracts any piece of metal that comes within its radius. And then we saw also that Jesus is the grace of God made manifest. And finally, we said grace is a sovereign decision of God to see a man in a particular way, akin to saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. These are the various definitions of grace that we considered in the first series on grace. In this fourth series, as I said, we are going to be looking at grace before the world began. And I want us to take our text from 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'll be reading from verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9. It says, Who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who had abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. Now, verse 9 that we read demonstrates that grace is not according to our works. God does not give us grace according to our works. God does not give us grace according to our abilities. God does not give us grace according to what we have done or according to what we have not done. Now, the giving of grace is not according to any of this. But the scripture, that scripture, verse 9, makes it quite clear that God gives grace according to his own purpose. I want to read that verse 9 again. It says, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. So God gives us grace, not according to our works, not according to what we can do or what we cannot do, but it is according to his own purpose. Amen. Now, I want us to also see from that verse that God gives grace in Christ Jesus. Grace is not given outside of Christ. If you're not in Christ, you're not going to have access to the grace of God that we are talking about. God gives grace to individuals. God gives grace to people who are inside of Christ. Why? He gives grace in Christ because all the counsels of God have fulfilled in Christ Jesus and not outside of Christ. No counsel of God can be fulfilled outside of Christ. It's eternal counsels. Every counsel of God, every purpose of God is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And that is why you have 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, saying, If any man be in Christ, in Christ, he is a new creation. You cannot be a new creation outside of Christ. You can only become a new creation inside of Christ. And that is where you have to be born again before you can become a new creation. Every purpose of God is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Let's see also Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Listen to what it says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. The blessings for the believer, which are spiritual and are heavenly, they are, they are given to us in Christ, not outside of Christ. Every counsel of God is in Christ. When God gives grace, he gives grace to those who are inside of Christ. Grace is not given outside of Christ because you cannot fulfill the eternal counsel of God outside of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 10. 
He says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. To gather together in one all things in Christ. God is going to gather everything in the universe in the final analysis in Christ and not outside of him. Ephesians 3 verse 11. This one is very crucial. Three, Ephesians 3 verse 11. Listen to what it says. It says, according to the eternal purpose which he proposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. According to God's eternal purpose. His purpose that has no ending. This purpose is in Christ Jesus. So God has an eternal purpose and this eternal purpose is in Christ Jesus. Now, God gives grace according to this eternal purpose. In other words, the eternal purpose of God comes forth and the God gives grace for the fulfillment of this eternal purpose. And this eternal purpose is in Christ Jesus and therefore the grace also is given in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now, this is very important. You see, not only is the grace meant for the accomplishment of God's purpose given in Christ, this grace was given before the, before the world began. Let me read that, that text again. Second, Second Timothy 1 verse 9 again says, Who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. God gave grace to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Again, all counsels of God are in Christ and they are eternal. God then gives grace for the accomplishment of this eternal counsel or eternal purpose of God. But this grace is given in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. Another word for before the world began is in eternity. Before the world began, another word for it is in eternity. That means that God gave us grace from eternity. God gave us grace from eternity. God gave us grace before the world began. In another way, before the foundation of the world. Before the angels were created. Because we are talking about the eternal counsel of God. God gave us grace in the timeless ages. When there was nothing like time. God gave us grace before time began. Because there was a period when there was no time. And there will be a period when there will be no time. After the 1000 years reign of Christ, we are not going to have time anymore. We are going to move into the timeless ages. And there was also timeless ages before God created this world and the time began. Remember the time is associated with the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the universe. Because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that God gave them, you know, for times and for seasons. So when we are talking about God giving us grace before the world began, what we are simply saying is that God gave us that operational ability, God gave us that undeserved, unmerited, and unearned favor in Christ Jesus in timeless ages past. Not in timeless ages still ahead, in timeless ages past. That was when God gave grace to us. And it was his suffering decision to do this. Nobody counseled him. Nobody advised him. Nobody told him. It was out of his own free will that he decided to give this grace to us. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, the Bible says that God has beforehand ordained that we should do certain things. Now, the phrase before ordained signifies that God has before beforehand chosen that we should do some good works. There are specific works that God has chosen that we should do before he created us. Amen. Now, listen, before man created a computer, we had challenges associated with producing, with processing a large amount of data in an efficient and in a timely manner. And because of this challenge, the computer was produced, was developed, was designed, developed, and produced, you know, to accomplish, you know, to, 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 in, 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 as a response to those challenges. It wasn't that it was after the creation of the computer, the production of the computer, that they started to look for things to do with it. No, there was a challenge. There was a challenge with respect to processing large amount of data at speed rate and and, and at a highly efficient rate. And something was needed to tackle that challenge. And that's why the computer was produced. 
Similarly, when God created man, he already had a purpose for man. He already had specific good works that he wanted men to do. And it was on the basis of these works that he went ahead to create man. And that's what that scripture is saying. For Ephesians 2 verse 26, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. His workmanship is piece of artifact created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God had before ordained. In other words, from eternity, before the creation of this physical universe, God had ordained that you as an individual will accomplish certain things on this earth, that you will do certain things on this earth. And it is on the basis of these things that he had predetermined before time that you would do that God gave you grace. God has not given you grace to accomplish your own purpose. No, God established a purpose for you. God designed certain good works that you would accomplish on the earth and on the basis of the purpose, God gave you grace to fulfill them. Amen. So it is not that you begin to look for. God is not looking for what you he wants you to do. God is not looking for something for you to do. God already had something for you to do before he created you. And grace has been tied to those things that he had ordained that you should do. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that you should work in. Praise God. So God's purpose is paramount in anything that he does. When God wants to do a thing, his purpose comes first. Amen. His purpose is singular and it is eternal from what we saw in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11. He says, according to his eternal purpose. He didn't say eternal purposes. No, he said, according to his eternal purpose. And this purpose has been before the world began. Praise God. Now, still in eternity, in eternity that is before the world began, God employed his foreknowledge or his omniscience in the determination of the part of his creation that would fit into is eternal counsel. Now let me try. Let me try to explain this carefully because many Christians get this mixed up. Now listen to this. I'm going to be combining the scriptures that we've read so far with Romans chapter eight, beginning from verse from verse twenty eight. Now listen to this. In eternity before time, in the timeless ages, God had a purpose, and this purpose is eternal. Amen. We've seen that in Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 11. Now, in for the accomplishment or in the process of the accomplishment of this purpose, God employed his foreknowledge. By his foreknowledge, we mean that we are simply drawing on the fact that God is omniscient. There is nothing that he doesn't know. And anything that God does is on the basis of his foreknowledge. Amen. Now, God knew this, God determined that this was his counsel. And on the basis of his foreknowledge, God is going to create, for instance, say 7 billion people on the earth. And God, on the basis of his foreknowledge, knew these 7 billion people that would be on the earth at this time. And he also looked at these 7 billion people. How many of them will receive my grace when I give it to them? How many of them will freely receive my grace when it is extended to them and would accomplish this purpose? And God saw the problem, for instance, that five billion will accept this grace for the accomplishment of this purpose. And two billion out of their own free will, because man has been given free will like God. He was created in the image of God. God has a free will. Nobody compels God to do anything. God also does not compel you to do anything. He created you in his image so that you can decide. And that is why when he created man, he said he counseled him, eat, eat, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but you can eat of every other tree, including that of the tree of life. God didn't force him not to eat of that tree. He didn't force him. God gave him free will. So God has given every human free will. So in eternity before these people were created, God had seen, he had seen on the basis of his foreknowledge, he had known that about 5 billion people, for instance, will accept his grace to accomplish what he wants to do. He had also seen on the other hand that the remaining 2 billion will not accept his grace out of their own free will, out of their own volition. Amen. What did God do? God now chose or elected the five billion and predetermined 
that this five billion should be conformed to the image of the to the image of Christ. Let me go through that again. God had an eternal purpose. On the basis of that eternal purpose, God employed his foreknowledge, his omniscience, to see the billions of people that will be created on the earth. From the basis of the foreknowledge, he knew those that would accept his grace when it is extended to them. And he chose or he elected those, those that would accept his grace. This was even before they were created or born. He elected those ones and he predestined that these ones should be conformed to the image of his son. Now note, I didn't say that he predestined them to be saved. No, because the scripture doesn't say so. It says he predestined them to be conformed to the image of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Now you have this, of course, all of this in, uh, in, in scripture. And a very good example that you have in scripture is that of uh, uh, Jacob and Esau. The Bible says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now, when God made this pronouncement, the two of them had not been born. They had not even been conceived by their mother. But from eternity, according to the divine counsel of God, God had seen that Jacob is going to accept his free will, though he's going to be, he's going to be given better as a cheat and as a liar and as a schemer, but God knew that by the time his grace is extended to Jacob, Jacob is going to accept it and fit into his purpose. God had also foreknown that Esau wasn't going to accept his grace when his grace is extended to him. And so God chose Jacob. And then he said, Esau, I hate. He's not hating Esau because he wants to hate him. He's hating Esau because of what he has seen that Esau is going to do out of his own free will. Again, the free will that God has given to man is at play in all of this. Praise God. Now, see First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect. The word elect there means to be chosen. And this choice or election is according to God's foreknowledge. In other words, God had foreseen, he had foreknown that these ones will accept his grace and then he chose them. Let me try and explain this again. Because often, often Christians are confused in this area. Because of the nature of God and that he created man in his nature, God does not force man to do anything. Absolutely nothing. He doesn't force man. The only thing is that if you continue to rebel against him in the final analysis, he's going to throw you into the lake of fire. Amen. Now, imagine... A man having a son, he sends this son to a good school or to a good university. Enrolled the son, provided everything that the son needed. And this man happens to also know that this son will not attend classes. This son will not read. Obviously, that son is not going to pass his exam and he's not going to come out of that university as a successful student. He's going to come out woefully. He's going to fail. He's going to come out with a third class in our time. Now, who will be responsible for that? Obviously, it's not the father. The father didn't give birth to him to fail. The father provided everything that he needed to be successful. But because of the attitude of the son, because of his not wanting to take responsibility for anything, it was obvious to the father and to anybody around that this son is going to fail. It is the same also with God. God, in, according to his foreknowledge, had seen, had known those that are going to accept his grace when the gospel is preached to them. And he had foreknown those that will not accept when the gospel is preached to them. This is a major attribute of God, God's foreknowledge. It comes into play when God is doing anything, especially in the accomplishment of his purpose. So the election we are talking about here is according to the foreknowledge of God, through sanctification of the spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Now, let me take you back again. Uh, praise God. I, I think before we go back, let's read Romans, Romans chapter 8. Then I'll be able to tie this with what I just concluded. Romans chapter 8, I want to read verse 28. He says, And we know that all things work together for good to them 
to them that love God, all things, it doesn't matter whether they are good or bad. If they are bad, they are going to work together for good for you. If they are good, praise God for that, they are going to work together for good or for you also. Now, who, who are these that is going to work together for good for? It says those that love God. And that to them, who are they called according to his purpose? Now, he didn't say purposes again. So all things around you, it doesn't matter what it is, whether it appears good or bad, God is going to work all of this together for good as long as you love God and as long as you are called according to his purpose. Now, look at verse 29. It says, from whom he did for no. Now, you can see his foreknowledge coming to play. In verse 28, we saw his purpose, who are called according to his purpose. In verse 29, the first thing that we see there is his foreknowledge. He says, for whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So, you see, the predestination is on the basis of his foreknowledge. It has something to do with his foreknowledge. You cannot divorce the predestination of God to be conformed to the image of his son from his foreknowledge. And you cannot divorce his foreknowledge from his purpose. They are all interconnected. And all of this happened in eternity. Amen. So that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. Now, let's tie all of this together. Now, listen carefully. God had a purpose in all of eternity. This purpose is not only in eternity. This purpose is eternal. And this purpose is to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. According to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. Now, on the basis of his foreknowledge, God chose or elected those that would fit into this purpose. By fitting into this purpose, I mean those that will be used by God, those that will willingly accept the grace of God in order to accomplish this purpose of God. God chose them. God elected them. And this was in eternity. Now, having chosen them, God then predestinated or predestined that these ones that have been elected or chosen should be conformed to the image of his son. To, of his son. Now, all of this happened in eternity. What did God do next? Still in eternity, God gave all of these ones grace. In eternity, he gave them grace. I want to repeat that again. God had a purpose. This purpose is eternal. This purpose is to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. On the basis of his foreknowledge, God chose amongst all humans that would, be, that would be born on the earth. God chose the ones that will accept his grace. And then he, he elected them or he chose these ones and they predestined that they be conformed to the image of his son. And then God gave them grace in Christ Jesus. And all of this happened in eternity before they were given birth to. Amen. Now, God now brought all of this that had been done in eternity, he then brought it into a period of time dimension. And that is what you see in verse, in, in verse, in verse 30. Verse 29, verse 28, 29, all of this happened in eternity. In Romans chapter 8, verse 30, he now brings it into a time dimension. And the time dimension began with the preaching of the gospel to you. When you accept the gospel, you are now justified. What is justification? Justification is the deliverance from the penalty of sin. The wages of sin is dead. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So when you are justified, it means that God has delivered you from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. So this was brought into time dimension. The gospel was preached to you. And when you accepted the gospel, you were justified. Amen. After you were justified, what happened? The scripture says you were glorified. You were made to sit with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places above every principality and power and mind and dominion. Amen. As I wrap up this section, God has not just given you grace. God has given you grace before the foundation of the world. This grace was given to you before you were born. This grace was given to you before you knew how to do good or bad. This grace was given to you according to God's eternal counsel for you. And this grace, this was now brought into time dimension when the gospel was preached to you.
As the gospel is preached to you, if you accept, you fit into this divine counsel of God. If you don't accept the gospel, you are lost in all of eternity. And therefore, that eternal counsel of God for you will not be accomplished. Amen. So God gave us grace. As long as you're born again, God gave you grace. Not at the time that you were born, this grace was given to you in Christ Jesus before the world began. But it became yours. You received it at the time at which you gave your life to Christ. And this grace that has been given to you is for the accomplishment of the purpose of God. And this purpose is eternal. Father, we thank you for grace that you have given to us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Thank you also for your eternal counsel which you are fulfilling in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, because your grace has located me. Lord, I ask that I will not receive your grace in vain. Lord, I ask that I will not frustrate your grace. Lord, I ask that I will not, I, I will not turn your grace into lascivious snares to do all sorts of evil things, but that, Lord, I will employ your grace to accomplish your purpose for my life. I thank you, Father. 